So good evening, folks. Welcome to our final in the series of uh, webinars for the year. Um, special welcome for those of you who have joined us from uh, not just Australia and New Zealand this time around, but also the Pacific Islands. Um, the goal in this webinar is to discuss uh, if the PowerPoint will run. We can see there we go. where we are with digital disruption. You've got it. And has COVID accelerated the change? So across the course of the um, the year so far, SIMTI Australia, New Zealand, Pacific Island has had several webinars to date. We've talked about working remotely in the in a pandemic. We've talked about how blockchain will take off in media and entertainment. We've had a good discussion about content of cybersecurity, and the last one was shifting to post-production in the cloud. Um, this one tonight is to talk about digital disruption and hopefully holistically encompass everything that we've talked about before. We've got some fascinating panelists for you. That's myself at the top there, then you see Mike Strine. Mike is the Director of Engineering and Technology from the ABC in New York. Um, he has sent his apologies in a way. He is with us in spirit. Uh, we pre-recorded his session uh, earlier in the week because right now it's 2.30 in the morning over there. Um, but trust me, he really brings an, an amazing insight into life in a very disrupted world. So Mike is the Director of Engineering and Technology at the ABC in New York. Our second guest is uh, Matt Eaton. Matt's the Managing Director for Europe in the Middle East and uh, in Australasia for Grey Matter in the UK. Um, it's not only a, a very smart and intelligent futurist, in my opinion. Uh, we worked a few years ago at Sky. He's been down here a couple of times. He's also not a bad bloke. Um, it's very kind of you, Dave. Cheers. Pleasure. Um, the third person in our little chat room tonight is uh, Paul. Hang on, I'll just uh, bring up the, the pictures. So Paul Broderick is uh, past president of Sinti Australasia or Australia. Um, he's here to help us along. Paul, do you just want to do a quick explanation of how the chat room works? Yeah, so uh, on your uh, control panel, which uh, in my screen is on the right, there's a little uh, chat area. Uh, you can either submit your questions uh, in the question area uh, or the chat area. The question area will track the questions and answers, so maybe a better place to put it. Um, and then uh, throughout the uh, session, I will endeavour to ask those questions of the panellists and uh, try and get your answers through to you before the end of the session. So they'll be intermingled through the session um or there'll be a, a time usually a time available at the end of the uh, webinar thanks david yeah okay and also mike's not with us but i've tried to ask him some vaguely intelligent questions um not sure how well i got on but we'll soon find out but please don't uh, be concerned if you if there are anything you really want to know if you can put it in the chat we'll put it forward to mike and and uh pass it on pass on his emails so Our subjects to talk about tonight, three subjects. So what effect has disruption had on, on our industry to date? Benefits and negatives. How has disruption affected our global response to COVID over the last year? And then lastly, and quite interestingly, how do we predict disruption will affect our industry in the future, both in the short to medium term and the long term? So quickly, for those who I'm sure most of us do, but just to recap for those who aren't quite sure what we mean when we talk about disruption, what is it? Well, the first probable disruption we all remember, or well, we don't remember, but somebody banged two rocks together and created a spark. What did that mean? It meant that people in those days could simply stay alive and, of course, uh, have heating to survive by. Of course, it made a fairly big impact on the, uh, of the rudimentary cooking industry or food preparation industry at the time. Next big one was probably the wheel. Again, think about what this meant to the transport industry and the hunting industries at the time. And then of course the spark and the wheel combined and along came the combustion engine and everything changed. 
of course then the Wright brothers came along and things changed again not so much this year but previously so transport tourism hotel industries everything got shaken up all over again so then in the last couple of decades of the 20th century along came this thing called digital disruption first came the personal computer then the internet then we had cell phones and we had uh, uh, laptops and uh, sorry um, tablets and laptops and PCs and it grew and it grew and it grew and then we had data centers come along um, and the next step of course was the development of everything being able to work together they're all connected and then the kicker of that is this little guy anybody who is more than 25 or 30 years old literally has never known life without what we the older generation call disruption so I click on the mouse in Fiji or the Solomons and these guys think nothing of controlling servers in Europe or the USA and there are millions and millions of examples of that happening literally every day so that is disruption and digital disruption hopefully in a nutshell so then we come to our first question so what effect has digital disruption had on our industry to date what are the benefits what are the negatives um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to one of the two people you've probably come to listen to. This is Mike Strine. Mike is the Director of Engineering for the ABC in New York. Um, and here's an interview we recorded earlier in the week. Yeah, what what, um, what has the digital disruption been like and, and what has it done? Well, I think um, there's a couple of ways you can look at it. What has it done to the industry? Um, I think way back when broadcasters didn't have much competition. You know, it started off, they were just over the airs, and then and, uh, after time it was cable. And uh, But digital has enabled a whole new type of, of competition and plus environments for that competition to thrive on. So over the top networks now, um, you know, we compete with with the Netflixes and all the other types of people that, that can put content out in any format to any device. So we need to do the same thing. And so broadcasters have had, have had to adapt and change and uh, you know, create new models where they can create content and deliver to the, the people the way people want to see it. I think um, you know, Disney as, as a company has done a great job creating Disney Plus and, and taking their other types of, uh, of content and being able to format it for the, for the new world. But um, it, it's, it's a different world. And, and if you don't adapt, you're not going to survive. But I think in production is probably the biggest impact. And that's where um, you know, traditional big broadcast equipment, big iron, what we used to call it, uh, has now evolved into, you know, real IP type, um, computer centric type gear. And, um, you know, what you used to be able to do in a very expensive uh, environment in a broadcast studio, many people can now do at home or they can do it in a very inexpensive way. And it scales tremendously. One of the things IP brings, and, and I think when you talk about digital disruption, you're talking mainly about IP. What has IP done to everything? And uh, it's enabled scale, scale of unbelievable, you know, enormous quantities. You can get content from anywhere. You can, you know, scale it and you don't have to worry about the size of your routers or your production switchers. Now you have the ability to make all sorts of enormous things. And then the cloud, you can now at some point expand into the cloud and, and take advantages there of where production and, and, and maybe the facilities that you don't have on premise you can grow into an off-premise environment. So I think uh, digital has disrupted uh, disrupted our, our business in, in any number of ways. So Mike, do you, in that, uh, in terms of news gathering and things, has uh, the development of the iPhone and the Android, has that had a big impact to you, do you think? Oh, absolutely, no question whatsoever. Uh, when I started in this business, we, uh, we rolled satellite trucks everywhere, and uh, we hardly do that at all. Everything is, is uh, cellular or bonded cellular. Um, there's no microwave. Very rarely is there microwave anymore. These were standard tools in electronic news gathering. Uh, they're barely used at all. Um, as long as you can have some sort of IP connection, um, you may edit a piece and, and go to your local Starbucks and send it back if you can't send it back from your phone itself. So, uh, you know, it, what the capabilities are, are tremendous now and uh, absolutely completely disruptive. And am I right in thinking that now the public have become effectively cameramen for you? Yeah, that, that, absolutely. 
the citizen video is what uh, they call it quite often. And, and, and frankly, sometimes it's, it's saturation. You know, there's too much, uh, you know, and, and one of the challenges is sorting through what's right and then getting the rights to air it, which is another thing. You know, uh, you can, you know, find some content, but then, you know, having to clear it, find out it's valid content because we're a reputable news organization. So you have to go and, and verify that content in multiple ways before you can actually put it on the air. And that's a challenge now, too. And the things like drones, has that had a big impact over in the U.S.? Or? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you look at what you used to have to rent a helicopter or rent, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, high end device with a gimbal mount to get the sort of pictures you can get with a, you know, a couple hundred dollar drone. It's absolutely amazing. Of course, you got to be careful where you fly these things and stay out of safe airspace. And, and there are regulations for this. I'm sure you have them in, in the countries you guys represent. But, uh, you know, here you have to have a, a pilot and, uh, you know, a licensed person that knows where what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. So, Matt. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Thanks very much for um, for inviting me along. Um, um, yes. So, uh, what effect has digital disruption had on um, our industry today? And just just by way of introduction, for those that don't know who Grey Meta is, we we create metadata driven solutions for digital assets, and we help clients in three ways. We uh, we help them uh, digitize content. Um, with, through our um, uh, tape to file uh, platform called SAMA. Uh, we have a QC tool uh, called Iris, uh, which is used widely and is uh, now um, available in the cloud. And uh, we have a metadata platform called Curio that brings in lots of different machine learning um, services to analyze content. So I always start with operations when I'm looking at how um, the industry has changed. I, I think uh, from an operational point of view, digital disruption has meant that it, we've moved as an industry from a uh, one to many point of view, as in, uh, you know, we, we prepare one version of the content, one version of asset, and then we distribute it to many people, or we broadcast it to many people um, via you know, a single medium. Uh, or TV or something like that. We've gone from one to many and a, uh, a push model into a, a many to many and pull model. So the consumers are demanding um, you know, the, the, the content. We are uh, preparing many versions for that to be played on a huge number of different devices. And that's fundamentally changed the way that operations work and also the way that the, the technology has to to be set up in the background in order to uh, deliver that content to all those different uh, users. Um, so you know, f let's not forget about that. Technology is there to, to support the business and to, to drive um, the, the business. With digital disruption, I think that relationship uh, is, is so much closer between technology and, and the business as well. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute, but. Um, the, you know, I, I remember, you know, the, the, the concept of broadcasters preparing content for linear and then it was distributed to, to VOD or to a digital platform has long gone, but there's still, you know, quite a lot of legacy systems and processes that are set up in that way with a, with a sort of a linear view of how uh, content is prepared and, and consumed, um, you know. Everyone knows now that there's a there's a lot of premieres going straight to VOD, straight to uh, digital, uh, and then maybe played on linear uh, at a later date. Um, I think one area that uh, is um, uh, has been very noticeable is um, lowering barriers to entry uh, in terms of increased competition uh, due to digital disruption, and we've seen that obviously with the OTT operators, with Netflix and uh, uh, and Amazon and, and the others, Apple, um, uh, coming into the area, into the uh, the industry in in a big way. Um, it means a huge ch choice for the for the consumer. So I think the, it, this digital disruption has been a, a great positive um, thing for the for the consumers, where they've got a huge number of um, um, uh, content. I mean, content 
has never been uh, as varied and as, as as invested in as it is today. Um, so that's that's definitely a positive. I think one other aspect to to think about is data um, the the importance of data of um, content data where Grey Mesa works a lot, but but also consumer data and knowing you know what the consumers uh, are, are watching, um, their preferences, and this can be seen in terms of recommendations, personalization, um, but also decision making around you know what content. Uh, should be acquired, what content should be produced, um, how am I going to retain those those uh, consumers and reduce churn? So I think I think data is a is a huge part of digital disruption. Um, and and one final area that I, I want to touch on is uh, you know the 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 idea of costs and how costs are managed within a, a our industry is changing fundamentally and if you watch Devon Croft or uh, other industry analysts they'll they'll very much focus on this area you're moving from a fixed cost model to uh, a more opex model you know where you in the past you had um, hardware that was dis depreciating over you know three five seven years um, and there was a cycle of procurement um you know matching that depreciation that's that's very much changing moving to an opex model where um you know, services um systems can be subscribed to um so you you've got um you know um, cloud-based services that uh, you know, you might subscribe to one year but not another year uh, and so i i think there's a there's a very much a a change in the the link between revenue and and the spend uh, for for broadcasters as well. Uh, that's that's something that's coming in, and it takes quite a lot of you know uh, change to to get your head around how those costs are managed. Obviously, cloud is a huge driver of that. Um, you know, enabling um, those kinds of services to be uh, available for subscription. Very cool. What about the the um, you know we're all walking around. I mean, I've got this little thing in my pocket. Do you think that's had a massive change or caused part of the change? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the um, the fact that most consumers have you know more technology in their pockets than you know some broadcasters in in their uh, you know um, in their back office is is incredible. Yeah, so. Um, I, th I think delivery of content to those those platforms is is one aspect, but also analysing what they're doing. Um, you know, and I think it comes back to data and and making sure you understand, you know, how your uh, consumers are interacting with your content. Uh, obviously, that those um, devices also allow you to. Um, you know, allow the consumer to to interact more and and to feedback more. So whether it's sharing, you know, clips on uh, or, or a hashtag or a comment on Twitter or um, that kind of thing, um, that that's that's really important. Um, and then you've got you know e gaming and, and and things like that where you know people become broadcasters themselves. So you, you know platforms like Twitch. Um, you know they're becoming platforms for you know consumers to broadcast on um and i think um you know this this kind of camera the quality the video uh, and audio you've got citizen journalists feeding um uh, content into broadcasters you know from um different events that that were not possible in the past as well so you know, it's it, it's a it's a huge part of digital disruption. Cool, thank you. Sorry for the uh, throwing you in there so suddenly at the start. <laughs> okay, um, Paul, have you got any questions for Matt? Yeah, we've got uh, one question that's come in, um, Matt, and it's uh, more around uh, the, the streamers. Um, if you had a, a guess with the way the industry is going and everything at the moment, uh, who do you think the, the winners and losers of the streamers? streaming services would be at the moment and uh, and would you pick one um i 
I it's it's more than my job's worth to 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 pick uh, individual um, companies. But um, one thing I would say is that um, in order to thrive and to, to to win in this environment, data is absolutely critical, and um, the winners will be uh, well. I, Sorry, there's two two parts. Data is really important. The other the other important part um, is is content. And um, you know, if you've got the best content, and content is still king, uh, in my opinion. But data is still is is, is a prince, if you like. Um, I think combining those two together is is absolutely critical. They are linked. You know, knowing what to uh, invest in in terms of production, it, um, you know, is 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 why they're using uh, the data. But um, yeah, uh, I, that's that's my prediction. And the more real time that data, uh, I guess, is uh, is better for the the broadcaster or the streamer in this case. Absolutely, absolutely. The um, the the fact that. I, I think collecting data is one thing, but um, analyzing it, combining it with other data sets and acting on it um, is is the real differentiator. Um, you know, I, I think the, um, the, 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 the there is a huge difference between um, just just having the data and, and then actually, you know, putting your money where the data is. Um, uh, so. Yeah. So one of the things we've seen in the market um, in the past, and this has been going for some time, is that with um, soap operas, you see uh, current affairs slowly drifting into a soap opera. It might be days, weeks after the event. And with uh, reality TV, we're seeing uh, public perception and public discussion starting to influence how those types of programs are run you know, in, in the day, the following day, or maybe a couple of days later. Do you see those? Um, things coming closer together as as they get more uh, access to live data and starting to influence the programs in a shorter time frame. Uh, yeah, I, the the only the only thing I'd say is that that's a bit of a double edged sword because it does date um, content very very much as well. Uh, so you've got um, um, you, you know you want the immediacy. Um, of uh, you know and relevance um, of, of a piece of content, but also it, it, it places it in a historical place. Uh, you know, it depends on on what the content is, I suppose. But um, uh, yeah, we, we can we can see we've seen that happening with COVID um, quite a lot. Um, and I think the other thing is that you know content uh, can be more personalised, and uh, we. We're seeing this with short form content happening. This concept of hyper personalization um, of content. The the fact that you know, yeah, you know, I may like golf and I uh, like fishing or something like that, and I'm served up an ad that appeals to uh, my preferences and my hobbies. Um, you know, I think in the future that's that's something where certain types of content um, in, in long form can also play. Um, and, you know, I think you've seen this um, somewhat in uh, um, BBC R&D have done some work around, you know, that, that kind of hyper personalization of, of content um, for viewers. So, you know, I, th I think that's where we'll, we'll see it playing out. Okay, Mike, so You've obviously had a hell of a year over there. Um, all sorts of things going on from from um, the protests in the streets, um, obviously what's been going on with the election, but the big impact obviously has been COVID, um, particularly in New York uh, to begin with. Um, how did, did digital disruption help you through that? What did you have to do and change um, to be able to meet those challenges? Well, funny you should ask, David. It was quite a mess. And hey, I happen to have a PowerPoint here that we can run over through. So let me uh, just change presenters here. I'll take it to me. And we'll grab this one. And I'll share. And tell me if you see my screen. I can see it beautifully. Good, excellent. So uh, full disclaimer here. 
Uh, in the New York Symphony chapter in June, we ran through uh, a number of the broadcasters got together and we ran through what our responses were to the COVID epidemic and uh, what we had to do in order to survive in, in, in that, um, that operating theater, let's say. And, uh, you know, this is what each of us presented. This is what I did for that group. And um, essentially, it's, it's what happened and how we coped and what worked and what didn't work. So normally, we prepare for emergencies and whatnot, essentially geographically. And we, um, if we have a problem in New York, we open our studio in Washington, um, or we have studios in California. And, um, you know, we also have distribution centers in, in New York and in Bristol, Connecticut, and Texas. And these are geographically, geographically diverse. And uh, that's how we have traditionally and, and always, it hasn't been a problem in the past, but that's how we get away and around problems. But we've never had, a, had a, any sort of a problem where everyone had to run out of the building all at the same time, all the buildings and all of our facilities. So what do you do about that? Well, it's also a, a, a big deal because all the infrastructure is in the building. We have not moved to any sort of cloud environment yet when the infrastructure is, is anywhere else. All the production, all the studios, all the operators, everything is meant to work in the studio. Broadcasting is one of the last environments where people have really worked from home. You know, the, the whole work from home concept has worked in many other industries, but it hasn't really touched broadcasting until <laughs> this past March. So when you deal with talent, this is something that we sort of understand. You know, the talent needs camera and lighting and IFB and, and some sort of connection, maybe a prompter. And here's two of our talent here in their home. So our, our electronic news gathering folks know how to do this sort of stuff. They could hook up the talent and connect them up. So it's like doing a remote. We've never had to do 40 to 50 of them all at the same time. So we kind of ran out of equipment, but this is what, what we wind up doing to these people. You add a few extra things in, you up their internet bandwidth a little bit, you put a UPS in their house. You wouldn't believe the sorts of, of problems we've had. You know, the talent is, um, is uh, on camera and maybe their air conditioner kicks in and then their router reboots and suddenly you lose them for 20 seconds. So, so you wind up finding ways to, to, to be a little more um, robust and resilient at their house. But editing graphics are another story. Um, these are high bandwidth uh, connectivity type of devices. You know, you're doing multiple things. Can, these people typically work in an edit suite, but we didn't have edit suites in people's houses. How do you do that? How do you take that infrastructure that's in the building and get it to the people's homes? Well, what we did was we, we survived a lot of this by using virtual desktop infrastructures. In other words, and, and, and high-speed interconnects typically through AWS. So we would find a secure link and a high-speed link to get back into the building and use these virtual desktops to connect back into the device, whether that was an editing device or a graphics device. Then to get the, what they typically look at is a, is a uh, sort of a multi-view of multiple things. Let's say you're an editor, editor and you need to see a whole bunch of remote feeds. So we would build the remote feeds and send them to the people's homes. So this was very creative. We did it a, a certain way, NBC did it another way, CBS did it another way, but we all came up with the same sorts of um, solutions just using different products. Here's a, an example of someone at their home. And um, there's somebody who's in their basement. I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but, but back in the corner are all their puzzles and things in their basement so you can actually tell it's their basement. This person went around, they grabbed every display they had, uh, they had the kitchen TV, they took a couple monitors, over here's an iPad, there's a phone, uh, they had a projector, they hooked up everything they possibly had, and they got some feeds that, that we sent back to them. So this looks remarkably like an editing suite that you just kind of threw together. But what's missing in this? Well, the key thing is communications. But one of the biggest problems we had, and I think most people have had, uh, broadcasters and whatnot, is, is the comms. Communications is how productions get done. A director is talking to someone, a producer is talking to someone. A Zoom call does not work for a production. You know, a, a conference call doesn't work. But the problem is we all have existing matrix-based intercom systems that aren't IP. So this is one of the biggest problems we had is bridging that to IP to get it to home. 
So it took us a real long time to get this sort of stuff working properly. So there were a lot of stumbles there. And uh, that, that was probably the biggest issue we had. And a couple of examples of, of, of people and how they work from home. Um, some of us felt like looters. You know, if we didn't have displays, we went running to the store or, or went into work for, for a moment and grabbed the display and brought it home. I mean, we were all on the train carrying boxes of mice and keyboards and displays and, and computers and bringing it all to our homes and setting them up. And uh, so we have here a couple of pictures of, of what people look like. Uh, here's another one. By the way, there's no truth to the rumor. We were creating a video with cats. Um, you know, may look like it there, but you know, it's, it's not really true. Um, there's another one. We uh, typically don't allow food in control rooms, but when you're working at home, hey, you got to eat. So, uh, you know, food is uh, encouraged. Uh, here's another setup. If you look down on the left, these people are actually doing a Zoom call while they're, while they're talking and they step back just to take a picture and they're all waving on the screen. But it's kind of creative the way people came up with different setups to work from home. I don't know of anybody who hasn't taken a bunch of books or going down to their library and propped up their display. I'm doing that right now so that so the camera's not looking at my chin. Uh, you know, it's looking at my face and propped up on two big giant books. So it's a fairly normal thing. Then to grab something to keep your phone up so you can touch your phone so you can check your email at the same time. You know, we all came up with creative setups to work from home. And here's a happy operator with a whack and tablet and the other sorts of things that we did. So the thing that really affected us and our planning is we're building a new facility. So we're, we're engaged in the, um, in the uh, planning process right now. There's a great big hole in Southern Manhattan where uh, we're starting to build a new building. We've sold all our buildings on the Upper West Side. So uh, this is happening. Uh, our occupancy is targeted for 2024. And it's a consolidation of all the Disney enterprises in New York. So Marvel, uh, Disney streaming services, all these sorts of uh, parts of our company, we're all going to go to one building. But we didn't plan. We, we planned for the infrastructure to be in the building, but also looking at colos and, and how to get it out. But let me tell you now, um, and here's a couple more artists' renditions of this thing. I don't have any, any anything other than that to show you. But it's really affected our planning. And how do we plan such that the operator's environment can be the same from home as it is in the facility? So it's essentially identical. And uh, that's a lot of what we're going through right now and how to create that. And uh, another part to that is um, for earlier this year, just before COVID started, uh, uh, I and a colleague, Carl Paulson, we wrote a, um, what, what a hybrid facility could look like. And this was before COVID. And I, I can only tell you that it's done nothing but accentuate the fact that this is where we need to go. So if you're a SEMPTI member and you get the journal, you look at June, then there's a, which June happened to be the audio edition for some reason, but they put our, our article about uh, essentially how to grow into a cloud facility in that, in that, in that journal, in that journal uh, <clears throat> issue. Anyway, um, that's my little presentation. So thank you. Uh, any questions you got, I, I wish I was live with you folks. So probably some things you could ans ans uh, ask and I could answer, but I'm glad to take them from you. Let me I might throw a couple at you, Mike. That was that was amazing. Um, it, it, yeah, you you dealt with it and dealt with it. Um, you've obviously had to deal with it under pressure and deal with it fast. Um, question for you: though, How did you? So you're obviously technically competent. You can set up your own stuff reasonably well, and and your engineering staff can too. What about your operational staff and your presenters? How did you handle the install for them? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, we sent a lot of people out to folks' houses, especially the talent. And and you'd be surprised, um, some of the talent, uh, and, and they had to make multiple trips to the talent's house. Because you first, you know, you didn't know how long this was going to go for. So you set them up, you put some flowers in and, and whatever, and then two weeks go by and the flowers don't look so good anymore. So then you go there and you get a display and you get something so you can have something spinning in the background and you change it. And you up their internet bandwidth and you add in a UPS or you add something else. Um, the operators, a lot of the operators are surprisingly savvy. Um, we had to get them the right equipment. So we either, you know, ship things to their homes and we wind up booking a lot more services. Excuse me, booking, um, you know, things to connect through AWS or, or bumping up people's um, internet bandwidth and stuff. So there was a lot of those kind of follow-up things. So it wasn't just an overnight. And it was to get it started and keep it going from there. 
so on that installation, I mean, obviously, so you've gone for this r remote control model. How long did it take you to to come up with that model? How how quickly did you start your um, your installations? Oh, it was immediate. It's basically over a weekend. Um, we had to sit there and say, how are we going to do this? We have to get everybody out of the building. New York essentially shut down. I mean, they uh, you know they they told everybody if you're not and you had a matter of fact they passed out these letters if you didn't have a special letter that said you were a key uh you know essential employee such as a first responder you couldn't come into the city and um so some of us got those letters if we had to work on the equipment news was was recognized as an essential uh, first responder and um you know we would get the gear and deploy it to people's homes as quickly as we can there was a lot of sleepless nights for the first couple of days, absolutely. And uh, some of the operation teams were just amazing in, in the jobs that they did. And that's just, not just ABC. We, we all, all the New York broadcasters did that. And I'm sure a lot of those things happened uh, across the world and, and in your environments as well. Yeah, I think though you're much more, because of just the population density, um, it becomes a huge, uh, a much, much bigger issue. You got any idea how many remote installations your teams would have done? Yeah, we have uh, over 80 um, editing and graphics uh, installations, and we have between 50 and 60 talent installations. That's not that we have 50 and 60 talent. It's that some of the talent has multiple places. <laughs> There's a, some some fairly wealthy talent, you might imagine, has one has a, you know a summer home and out by the pool house and their apartment in New York. So there might be a, you know multiple installations for them. We won't name any names. <laughs> Okay, and then from uh, my background, which is play out, or what you would call, I think, MCR in the States, how did you deal with that? Was that, uh, did, you, did you try and go for that remote, or was it bringing in teams in um, uh, secluded groups? So when you say play out, do you mean play out for news environments or play out for, uh, let's say, primetime television shows? Uh, let's well, start with primetime television shows, but then let's come back to news as well. Yeah. So your transmission group did that stay yes. centralized? Or? We we remoted. We I, I got to tell you, most of what we did was secure, but there were a few things where we had to cut corners security wise, and um, you know some of that was was how we get in to control the switching, especially how we distribute to our affiliates through satellite and whatnot. So uh, we had to remote into systems to do some of that. We had some key maintenance people that never left the building. Uh, as I said before, communications that was a key element um my comms guy never left the building he, he's been there the entire time we never got him any time um so some key people were there some key play out um but a lot of the manipulation the editing the insertion of commercials the packaging of of, of things could be done remotely um some of the news programs could be aired remotely um so you know once you got used to some of the timing latencies and and uh you know timing things up it, it actually worked pretty well Obviously, you can't mic the talent from home. You can't do a camera operation from home. You can't light from home. So some of the studio operations, those people had to be. One of the things that uh, I know Mike was talking about was the complete change going forward in the way the world has to think. So they're in the process of building um, a very large facility in the middle of Manhattan, um, which they're in the design stage. Uh, and I hope I'm not misquoting them, um, that there will be multiple um, broadcasters sharing that facility, it's all under the same banner. And the thing that really has caught them with COVID is now everybody has to be able to work remotely. Um, and they're having to completely change their designs to to deal with that have you struck much of that in your business that people are suddenly saying hang on we're now working remotely that's changed the way we think yeah and i i i don't think it's it, it, it's been fully realized or, or or processed i mean i think that it's been enforced on us um but um uh, you know i i do think all of this is, you know, was predicted in terms of, you know, the trends towards 
you know, more cloud-based working, you know, um, you know, working remotely, uh, you know, um, I, I think you know, this is this is this is something that was talked about, you know, at length. So the, the movie labs, you know, published a, a paper in December last year talking about how, you know, a 10-year vision for uh, working in the cloud um, where content would be produced, um, you know, processed and distributed all in the cloud without being, um, you know, pulled down and incurring egress costs and, and, and things like that. So, you know, COVID has accelerated that um, hugely. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, tech, technically, um, we, we are in a good place. I think, I think culturally and, and, and how teams are working, um, that's, that's what you're kind of uh, alluding to, I think, Dave. Uh, which is more more of a challenge i think is you know getting your head around you know working remotely and and, and having teams set up and and keeping people motivated and engaged as, as employees i think that that that's that's a you know a, a bigger uh, kind of question but i think technically uh, you know we we um covid has allowed us to you know prove um, that this is possible, that, 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 that cloud-based um, working um, is where we are going. And, and um, you know, I, I, so I, I, think, I think whilst it, it answers some, some questions, I mean, it does throw up other questions about long-term, uh, you know, how uh, people will work remotely longer term. Uh, one, one thing, you know, one consideration I think was really important, which, you know, is, is security and, and, and making sure the content is secure through all this. Um, you know, I, I, and I think this is this is something that, um, you know, it's tested um, the, the, the security, the, the, the whole COVID situation. I mean, you know, I, I think, um, you know, it's tested some of those potential vulnerabilities um but it, it, it's an area where there's going to be sort of you know a, a, i think a lot of sort of focus on um uh, going forward you know re remote working is great but you've got to have secure content because you you don't want that getting out um pre-release for example and things like that so you know it's, it's definitely something um to, to focus on that's actually a, a, a very good point. Uh, one of the things that digital disruption has done for us has meant um, we, we can access things around the world much more quickly, much more easily. Um, but that also means that piracy has ramped up and taken off um, and security has become a huge, huge part of the, of, of the world we live in. Yeah. Um, yep. In terms of, sorry, COVID in the UK, Anything beyond the customers you've talked about that's really endemic or that has changed with COVID that, that again, digital disruptions uh, had a big effect on? I'm sorry if you mentioned before, I was de no, desperately no, trying no, to... I, uh, think, I, think, I, think, yeah, I mean, I, I just go back to, I mean, I think it's remarkable how, um, you know, companies have continued, um, you know, in, in uh, you know, to do the, you know, what they do. I, but the, uh, you know, I think, I think Arrow Media is a good example where, you know, they've been working with remote editors and, and, and you know, the, the missing component was metadata, you know, how, how can I find my content? They already had their content in the cloud. So they, in many ways, they were already ahead of, of some of their competitors, um, you know, but um, in order to, find and use that content they needed metadata uh, remotely and they innovated very quickly um, you know they um, you know changed processes uh, changed um, some of the systems um, and uh, you know within and we're talking within you know a, a few weeks they were able to uh, work very successfully uh, remotely um, so you know I, I I think um, you know there's been a lot of uh, new ch changes brought about you know very very quickly um, but um, you know they, they've sustained and and they've they, you know 
I, I think that's a, that's a really important part of digital disruption as well. I, you know, the, these incremental changes and improvements, rather than a six-month-long project to, to to migrate to a new uh, you know pr process or new new system. Uh, that's you know, I, it's a much more agile approach uh, to change has been enforced on us because we don't have the time. Um, you know, and I, th I think that requires a bit of a cultural change within the organization um but um you know from our customers point of view they've, they've all worked um very well to do that so mike here we go first question then how do we predict that digital disruption will affect our industry in the future both short to medium term and long term and i appreciate its future gazing but where do you think this is going to take us well, that's quite a challenging question. Um, I would say we're going to go in the same direction. It's just going to explode all over. I mean, the, the, what the cloud has now done and what COVID has accelerated. I mean, the, the, the ability for us to work and, and, and we've used the cloud as a, as a mechanism to get back to the infrastructure in our facilities. Pretty soon we'll be using the cloud to, to create and do everything like that. And, um, you know, will we even have in the future facilities? You know, maybe we won't. Maybe we'll do everything using cloud services. Um, you know, will there be, quote unquote, broadcast type equipment anymore? You know, maybe we'll, um, maybe all this stuff will, will, will be the same as what consumers use. So I, I think that the capabilities have, have come down such that the consumer has the same, but I mean, when I say consumer, I mean, you know, just about anybody. Um, has the same capabilities and, uh, and tools in their grasp to create content that, you know, high-end people can. So it's bringing these tools to the masses um, that has totally disrupted our industry and has disrupted most industries. So I think, um, yeah, the, the, the cloud is a production mechanism, but also as a distribution mechanism. So, you know, why, you know, you, you can almost create your own network now, create your own TV channel. I mean, you see that on YouTube, they don't have the viewers um, that established broadcasters have, and maybe they don't have the credentials, but maybe they will in the future. You know, uh, who knows? It's a wild, wild west out there, Frank. So just on that, as that's happening, you know, there's death of a thousand cuts to broadcast. Do you, do you predict that? Do you see that where, um, you know, now you can do a knitting channel on YouTube? Um, you know, there's gardening channels, there's all sorts of different channels that don't, I'm not sure if they do exist in the US, but um, uh, in the broadcast medium, but now you can get all of that going OTT. Yeah, do you niche, niche channels. Niche? But uh, what, what I think is that what still sets you apart is the quality of your content. And if you have the storytellers, which Disney as a company has always had, that sort of storytelling, and, uh, you know, it's one thing to have the tools, but to have the mindset to create the sort of, of, of shows that people want to see. You know, you see that in, the, you know, the Star Wars thoughts and, and uh, you know, all the sorts of uh, Marvel, all these sorts of, of characters and roles and things that, that strike with people and that people want to see. And as long as, you know, us or, or other types of content companies can still strike and, and, and hit something that resonates in people, I mean, I, I think that is still going to be uh, the differentiating factor. You know, uh, people will watch um, a crummy version of a, of a, of a uh, you know, a, a movie that they really like rather than watching a spectacular version of something that they don't want to see. So, um, you know, there's uh, content, uh, they, we said content is king, I think it still is. Mm -hmm. Are there any technologies you think we should watch? I mentioned blockchain earlier and I mentioned cyber security earlier. Is there anything that you can see on the horizon that you're kind of sitting up and paying attention to? Well, I think immersive technologies, you know, only uh, lead to you becoming more involved in the content. But I think interactive technologies, I think esports is going to explode. And especially as, as uh, you know, esports then ties into uh, sports gambling. I mean, that's something that that really hasn't happened a lot in the States. It's been a little more popular worldwide, but as people are now constantly involved in, in sporting events and they can bet on anything, 
you know, uh, that's going to involve a, a uh, you know, an, an involvement in the show. So that interactivity in, in this sort of content and maybe creating different endings and things, you know, uh, the, the, what people want to see, you know, the, the people want what they want nowadays, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily want what you want them to want. So how do you change that? And how do you, uh, you know, tailor content to everybody? So uh, I think interactive, immersive, and um, you know, esports where where gamers work together, and, and the technology that's around the gaming industry is just absolutely mind blowing. Cool. Okay. Well, that's us. I think um, I, we'll we'll move on and and uh, and talk to the other guys about what they've got to say. But thank you so much for the time you've spent, uh, Mike. You really have opened our eyes, I think, and uh, from everyone around Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific come on down and see us, we'd love to have you. It's my um, pleasure, I was in Australia in, in January, love to come back and uh, hopefully we'll get the world a little bit safer for travel and we can do it again. Brilliant, thanks for your time, mate. You got it, thank you. One of the, uh, one of the questions that sort of uh, has, has um, come up more to do with a previous um, a previous uh, webinar that we ran, but uh, may uh, you, your company or you know may know companies that are working on it is that uh, post production in the cloud and a lot of other cloud services, whilst there uh, you know these things seem to be becoming more possible and uh, people are definitely using them, and uh, as you say, a much more agile approach, being able to change things very quickly. The one thing that uh, it seems to be a little bit elusive is uh, the bill shock at the end and so that uh, they whilst they can set these things up quickly and get things running quickly you've absolutely no idea how much it's going to cost uh, is is there anyone uh, in in the industry working towards a um, like a little rate card type thing that works on uh, Microsoft or uh, AWS or something like that that can give you some sort of indication of what your what your costs are going to be like a little app or something like that that uh, runs in the background um it's um i think i think it's part of changing um your you know the broadcaster's sort of uh, competencies and and knowledge i mean it, it, it just in the same way that uh, you know you, you companies will need to become more aware of the compute they're using and be able to predict those costs and and you know to to forecast um you know the the cloud does does allow you to um uh to burst and to to handle um at scale you know content at scale but but yeah you you need to pay for it so you, so planning and um and uh, it, it is a huge part of uh, you know a uh, you know a cloud based operations i think um, what we what we heard at, uh, on one of our and sorry you probably weren't in on on, on that session but was um, that the the major broadcasters and uh, streaming companies the streaming companies are probably more au okay with it than the broadcasters um, would have access to an IT team that could actually do that forecasting and stuff in the background whereas a smaller post production company who just want to take advantage of this type of technology may or may not have access to those sorts of resources. So they're sort of left a little out, you know, yeah. more at risk, if you like, because they've got, you know, smaller bank balances and uh, less knowledge. So they're more exposed. So I just see there's a bit of a gap in the uh, in the market there. Whereas uh, if you've got a great big IT department, sure, you can do all this research and work all this stuff out. If you're a small post-production company, you're going to take a punt and it could send you bankrupt. Yeah, no, I, 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 it's a really important point. I mean, I, I think what, I think vendors are starting to um, pick up on this. I mean, one one thing that we do in terms of our pricing for um, uh, for our machine learning service platform, for example, is to you know to create that predictive pricing uh, for them uh, based on a you know a, you know. A, an agreed volume, um, a monthly volume that, you know, as long as you're going to be doing 50 hours you know, a month or something like that, then, you know, the, here are 
the costs. And um, you know, I, I think it's up to you know vendors to to help um, address that as well um, as, as as much as possible. Um, I, I know a, um, you know the, the the cloud providers uh, are there to you know that they want to drive consumption and and will only be too pleased to talk to people to to help um, predict. Um, but it is uh, a new way of working that you know is fairly technical that you know people need to be aware of. Um, but um, you know, yeah. It's, it sort of comes back to I think a point you were saying at the beginning uh, was that you move from a, more of a capex model to an opex model. Yeah. Um, I think there's a bit of maturity that needs to be brought into uh, you know, some of these big technology companies mm -hmm. as to somehow helping the small player in uh, working out what their opex might look like, as you say. So I think, yeah, uh, there's a little bit more work to do. I think collectively as a <clears throat> you know the technology providers. Yeah. I, and I, I think digital disruption, as well as you know, in in, in some ways it makes certain job roles uh, obsolete. So you know, no longer maybe a tape librarian, but you know, a they are more of a, a, a digital content curator. Um, you know, it does change roles uh, within an organisation, and I think one really important role uh, the digital dis disruption brings around is is the whole DevOps. Uh, role uh, understanding, you know, where you know a traditional IT department might uh, you know have that knowledge, uh, and an awareness I think of APIs um, and how to uh, join up different systems to to work together to create new solutions. I think that that's that is something that um, uh, it, I think is critical to, to 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 making the most of digital disruption. I believe. Um, mm. So I think new roles need to be created sometimes. Yeah, and I, I see uh, you know, for these smaller players, there's certainly an opportunity there for, uh, for someone to start thinking about how to plug that gap. Yeah. I think one thing that's uh, come out of this discussion is that metadata is uh, extremely important, and probably the uh, the more you gather and the the earlier you gather it in the in the process, uh, the more you've got to play with to actually. Um, uh, manipulate or or um, or structure and steer the outcome that you're trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and one, one thing I would, do, one parting comment is that it still all comes down to great storytelling. Uh, you know, there's a lot of changes, but at the end of the day, if you can't tell a good story, you know, you don't have a business. And you know, mm -hmm. I think we should hang on to that as 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 an industry. Um, because you know that 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 that's going to be the north star for for all of us is you know it's all it all comes down to great storytelling. Yeah, the content is king. I've heard that so many times in my career. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you, folks, um, and huge thanks to you guys. Um, and we'll get that out to you, the rest of it out to the, either by way of another webinar or. Um, or email or putting it into the recording and let you know because uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Thanks again. Thanks, Matt, and look forward to seeing you down here again sometime. Thanks. Look forward to it. Thank you for inviting me. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks for your help, Paul. Thanks, folks. Bye.